Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Uh, We're going to be studying verses 22 through 27. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 22. Often we get put in these uh, uncomfortable moments, and maybe you can sympathize with uh, me on this, where um, there is a certain amount of unity you have with somebody. You're agreeing about a lot of things, uh, but there's not full unity with them, and there starts to be a disagreement. Let me give you, <coughs> let me give you an example. Um, sometimes this takes place with the secular world. You know, you're starting to joyfully unite with somebody who's an unbeliever, and you're celebrating uh, something like a love for barbecue and, and grilling. But then the person goes a little too far, and he says something like, you know, grilling is heaven. You know, this is as good as it gets, isn't it? And you you have to, I don't know, maybe you don't disagree in that moment because they know that's not really heaven. But, uh, you know, it it can help to gently clarify. Or other time, there's there's other religions. uh, And they will say, they will unite with you on the fact of something like it's good to make sure we give thanks for what we have. Uh, Or they'll say something like they also believe in the sanctity of human life. But just because we're united on some of those issues doesn't mean we're actually really unified with them. Uh, This even happens with those who uh, go by the name of Christianity but have lost the essence of the gospel. You know, they will nod along, and and maybe you've encountered a situation like this. They they nod along because they use all the same words, and so you're trying to communicate with them, and they just think they're agreeing with you the whole time uh, when they don't actually know the gospel and they don't believe the gospel. It needs to be corrected. There's a part of us uh, that just longs to rest in the unity that we do have with those people. It's way more comfortable uh, to just uh, feel that unity, feel that uh, camaraderie. We're at peace with that person. But hopefully there's another part of us uh, that's not at peace, that longs for them to know the rest of the story. Yes, maybe they have a few facts right, But they need the rest of the story. They need the real gospel. They need the truth as it's presented in the whole word of God. Yes, there's a need for gratitude, but there's also a need for forgiveness, and they need to know that. Uh, Yes, uh, earthly life is precious, uh, but so is eternal life, and they need to know that. They need to be thinking about that. Uh, Yes, God's good gifts are meant to be enjoyed, and we can celebrate that. Uh, But God himself is also meant to be enjoyed. We're supposed to know him. Well, today we're going to get a master class from the Apostle Paul uh, in how to deal with this. Uh, He's going to find so much that uh, they already believe in common with him, most of the people there. Um, They're going to have many correct views. In fact, he's even going to quote from some of their own writings uh, as he's speaking with them. But then he's going to correct them and guide them into a full knowledge of the gospel. Uh, If you remember, last week we began to explore the city of Athens together. And we met uh, Jews that are there that that meet in a synagogue. We met uh, idolaters um, because there's so many different sanctuaries and little uh, idol temples throughout the city. Uh, We see Paul talking to all kinds of people in the marketplace. Uh, And then we see him meeting these uh, philosophers, Epicureans, and Stoics, uh, all kinds of people. Paul is spreading the word to basically everybody he comes across, and, and some are going to mock him, but others are curious, and so what they do is they drag him to this hill where uh, they can hear more about what he's teaching. The, the hill is called the Areopagus, and this is how our text begins. So look at Acts 17, verse 22. It says, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. So Paul says that he has seen, and we're just going to stop there for just a moment. Paul says that he has seen much about their life. Uh, They're so religious that they have all the bases covered that they even have an altar to an unknown God because they know that they don't know the full story. 
Uh, so he's, he's telling them that he sees their religion. You can see Paul's love in this moment. Uh, he has entered into their world. He's already observed their life, and, and he's concerned about them. He's not standing up here just because he wants to be the victor in some debate and defeat these people and have the superior philosophy. Uh, he's not looking for earthly glory. He, he's standing there because he knows they need this saving truth. He sees that they're very religious, but he knows that that's not enough. They need the gospel message. So you can see Paul's love. You can see Paul's wisdom. Remember that uh, the Areopagus, it wasn't only a forum to just hear new ideas and uh, get some entertainment. Remember that the Areop- Areopagus was also used in this formal sense of like testing ideas to see if this guy needs to be sentenced for bringing in heresy or something. So if that's what they're doing, if this is a more formal process and, and they're getting on to Paul for introducing new deities, well, you could see his wisdom. Because how does he start this? He says, it's actually you. You have all these altars and you even have one to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. This isn't a new deity. Uh, Don't persecute me for that. Uh, Instead, you know there's an unknown God and I'm telling you I know him and I'm proclaiming him to you. You can see his wisdom. You can also see Paul's understanding of human nature. He knows that they know that they're missing something. He knows that they know that they're not satisfied with the current pantheon that they claim to worship. They know that there is more. And Paul has seen this and he understands this. These philosophers have puzzled out some truths about the Creator. And Paul will admit this. He'll admit where they puzzled out something that is actually true. But then he's going to call them to much more. They need to know the rest of the truth. If they want to be saved, they need to know the gospel. They need to repent. They know some things about God. But Paul knows God. I'm going to say that one more time. They know some things about God. But Paul knows God. And Paul says, what therefore you worship as unknown this I proclaim to you. And that's the rest of our passage today is what is he going to be proclaiming? Uh, As he says, this I proclaim to you. And what we'll see is that um, he's going to proclaim God's character. He's not giving any credence to their idol worship. He's not saying it's good that they have all these temples and they even have one to an unknown God. He's not doing anything like that. Instead, he's finding a point of agreement and he's launching off from there and he's correcting their wrong thoughts so they can really come to the Lord and understand who he is and what he's like. So as we study today, we'll see that Paul is introducing them to their maker. Uh, He's introducing them to their maker. He gives three attributes of the true God. The true God is boundless. That'll be verse 24. The true God is independent in 25, and the true God is sovereign in verses 26 and 27. So as he makes this proclamation to them, he he says that the true God is boundless, the true God is independent, and the true God is sovereign. We're going to step through each one of those attributes as we study those verses. Uh, But first, let's back up and read the whole text all together. So look at uh, verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said... Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. We're going to stop there. 
uh, for this morning and finish up um, the rest of the passage next week. But before we jump in, let's pray. Uh, Father, as we turn our minds and hearts to uh, this speech from the Apostle Paul, uh, we pray that you would help us see your character on display. Uh, more than just see it, we pray that you would help us marvel. Remember how different you are than us. Remember how glorious you are. We pray that you would cause our hearts to be humble as we worship, as we exalt you for your character. And Father, as we go through this, I pray that you'd also help us learn about how to uh, gently approach those that might share ideas with us uh, but don't know the whole story. Help us have the same passion as Paul uh, of bringing them to a full knowledge of the truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this passage we're studying today. We pray that you'd help us understand, pay attention, and, and be doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first attribute is that the true God is boundless. He is infinite. He is uncontainable. Look at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. He is very different from the idols that those people are worshiping. The true God, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Now already, this is actually a point of agreement that Paul has with the Epicureans and the Stoics. Uh, we have a lot of writings of theirs from this time, and they would say the same kind of thing. Uh, the Epicureans had writings that, uh, that even made fun of the fact that gods would dwell in temples. Um, remember, the Epicureans, we, we talked about them last week, they took the whole pantheon lightly in general. It was something to be made fun of in general. Uh, and so they would poke at uh, the idea that any kind of deity would live in, uh, live in a temple. The Stoics had writings as well about how if there was an infinitely powerful being, then how could you ever think that you could contain him in four walls? This is what reason demands, is what they would say. And Paul is capitalizing on that and saying, when you look out at creation, you know, you, your philosophers have reason to this, that there is a divine creator. And you know that if there is a divine creator, then you know he wouldn't be able to be contained in a box that humans made. Foolish. Uh, their reasoning about this is correct. Uh, there is one true God. There's not a pantheon of equals. Uh, there is one true God, and he is the God who actually made the world, uh, and he is the God who actually made everything in the world. There's one true God, and since he made all things, uh, then he's the master of all things. Paul says that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He's the master of heaven and earth. He's in charge of all things. Well, if he's the maker of heaven and earth, and if he's the master of heaven and earth, then of course he doesn't live in temples made by man. Well, remember that there were Jews in this town as well. And as a Jew is hearing this, maybe uh, you might think that there would be uh, kind of an elephant in the room about this. Uh, because one of the things that they celebrated is that there used to be a time when God gloriously dwelled in the temple to bless his people Israel. They had the tabernacle, and then later Solomon built that temple, and the glory cloud entered the temple. So how is Paul saying this, that the true God wouldn't live in a temple? But I don't think that this uh, would have actually been an elephant in the room for a Jew who really knew the Old Testament. Uh, because they always believed this. Even from the very beginning of having the temple, if you remember King Solomon, at the dedication of the temple, he said this, listen to this. Uh, he says, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven in the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall dwell there. 
that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. So the Jew who knew the Old Testament, they knew that their God was different than what the other nations are claiming about their gods. It's not that they have some deity that's been contained in their temple and can't leave, and they need to bring sacrifices and help that God. Uh, No, it's that God cannot be contained. Even the highest heaven cannot contain him, and yet he has chosen to place his presence in a special way in this temple so that his people can come and worship. The other nations boasted in their idols. They would even make fun of the Jews. You know, they'd poke fun and and say, look, we have our idol right here. Where's yours? You know, where's your God? We can't find your God. Uh, Listen to an interaction like this. This is from Psalm 115. The psalmist says, why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. Do you hear what he's doing there? The nations are making fun. You know, they have the idols. Well, where's the God of Israel? Where's their idol? Isn't it so foolish? They don't have an idol. And the psalmist says, why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. This is totally different. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He doesn't need our help. He's boundless. We don't contain him in a temple. He's boundless and infinite. He is uncontainable. Well, if the philosophers that are hearing Paul, if they had already reasoned to this, well, then Paul is saying they're on the right track. Uh, God can't be contained. If he's a creator, of course he can't be contained. They're on the right track, but that doesn't mean they actually know God. The same is true about you. If if you have already reasoned to this, well, then you are on the right track. Uh, But that doesn't mean that you actually know God. The infinity, the boundlessness of God should provoke you to something. It should move you. There should be a response to this. There is a right reaction to the truth. It's not just something to philosophize about. Is that a word? Uh, It's not just something to ruminate about. It's something to have a reaction to. Listen to this. This is from Isaiah. It says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? The same idea. You can't contain, you can't build something that's going to contain me. Heaven is my throne. But listen to what he says next. He says, all these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is contrite, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. There is a right reaction to the boundlessness, to the infinity of God. It's not to try and build something so that we can say, here, I have God here that I'm going to bow down to. The right reaction is to humble ourselves and to read his word and to tremble at it, to take it seriously, to seek to really know it as he has revealed it. He wants you to listen to him. He wants you to be humble and contrite in spirit and tremble at what he's revealed. So when you look at an animal, for example, and you see already that that animal is such a beautiful creation of the Lord, and then you go deeper and you see, wow, there's these these eyes that are there. There's these muscles, and it's also perfectly created. And you go deeper, and you see at the level of a cell, everything's working perfectly uh, in a cell, and it's also perfectly in balance. And then you go even deeper, and you see even on the level of the, the compounds and the elements, the atoms and their atomic forces, everything is just working so bizarrely, amazingly perfect. Or if you're scaling out the other way, you look out and you see a giant sequoia tree and it just moves you because it's massive and you're in awe. And then you look past the tree and you see a mountain, you know, even bigger. And it fills you with awe again because it's so huge. And you look out past that mountain and you see the stars and the sky and the vastness of space and all of creation, all of those things from the tiniest to the largest that's meant to move you, that's meant to cause you to realize There is a creator, and he's the maker of all things, and he's the Lord of heaven and earth. And he wants something from you. He wants you to listen to what he's revealed. 
He created all those things with the word of his power. And then he revealed a word that he wants you to know and he holds you responsible to know. His boundlessness should make you tremble. Uh, He is very different from you. Uh, He is very different from you and he's worthy of our worship. Well, the second attribute is that the true God is independent. Uh, He is self-sufficient. He doesn't rely on anything. Yes, uh, he offers himself in relationship, but he's not dependent or needy on us. He's self-sufficient. Look at verse 25. Paul says, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Now, surprisingly, again, this is another point of agreement with the Stoics and the Epicureans. Uh, We have their writings that say this exact same kind of thing. Um, The Stoics had literature on how the the divine, remember, they took the divine seriously. And they said, well, the divine wouldn't need servants. Uh, It would be the God, the divine, who served. He wouldn't need to be served. He doesn't need anything. Uh, The Epicureans uh, went so far as to reject sacrifices. They wouldn't do sacrifices like all the other pagans. And their reasoning was that, well, gods don't need human things. If there is this pantheon, then they don't need things from humans. Why would they be dependent on humans? So again, uh, Paul is, is finding a point of agreement. They had reasoned to this already saying that if there's such thing as a God, then he wouldn't need anything. Why do people say we need to bring him sacrifices or provide for this deity? And Paul's statement shows that this reasoning is correct. But then he goes on. He's proclaiming to them the true God, that there is a God, a true God, and he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. There's just one creator, and he has provided all things, life and breath and everything. He doesn't need us to give anything back to him. He doesn't need anything. Well, we've run into another potential uh, elephant in the room for the Jew. What about the kings who used to rule over his people, isn't that being served by human hands? Didn't the Lord God in the Old Testament set up this service for people to serve him? What about the prophets that used to speak his word to people? Weren't they servants? Wasn't God being served by human hands? What about the Levites? They were constantly serving, uh, taking down the tabernacle when it was time to move, and when it was time to be still, they, they'd put the tabernacle back up again. You know, all the poles and the tent pegs and everything that went with that. Um, The priests, they were serving. They were cleaning the altars and they were cleaning the vessels. They were sacrificing the clean animals and then they were cleaning up afterwards. You know, just this perpetual service, the Lord being served by human hands. Well, again, if a Jew is listening and if they actually knew the Old Testament, then they would just shout out another amen to what Paul is saying here. They know that the Lord doesn't need anything. He's not served by human hands because he needs something. Uh, God did not require those things because he was in need. He established those things because of his people's need to be able to have a way to worship a true and holy God. Guilt offerings didn't exist because God was guilty. It's ridiculous. Uh, Food offerings didn't exist because God was hungry. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 2 says, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. He doesn't need anything from us. Uh, Even if he did get hungry, he wouldn't tell us. He has the cattle on a thousand hills. Psalm 135, verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth and the seas and all the deeps. There's nothing he needs. If there's anything he ever wants to do, he can do it. It's the false idols over and over in the Old Testament that we see are dependent on those who made them. They're dependent on those to to chop the wood and carve the wood. They're dependent on those to melt the gold and make it into an idol. 
They're dependent on humans to cart them around because they can't even move themselves or talk for themselves. It's the idols that are dependent. The true God, he isn't served by human hands as if he needed anything. Uh, He doesn't need humans to give him life. Uh, He gave humans life and breath and everything. Man is dependent on God. Uh, God is independent. He is self-sufficient. What does this mean for you and me? I think that there's a million ways you could apply this, but I just want to give a couple on this point. And the first is that he doesn't need you to be saved. The Bible says that he desires all men to be saved. But it doesn't ever give the picture that he needs you. And sometimes we can hear in songs or in sermons, uh, you can hear this idea that, that makes it sound like God is incomplete without you that he's just desperate, he's lost without you. Uh, He needs you to come. But he's very complete, even without you. He's eternally complete. He doesn't need anything, and he's not served by human hands. Uh, It's never we who do him a favor by coming to him for salvation. (laughs) Sometimes we accidentally think that way. But it's never we who do him a favor by coming to him for salvation. It's his grace that he has graciously given to us. We're the needy ones. He has provided, joyfully, lovingly provided. But we're the needy ones. But what about after you're saved? Uh, It's the same. Uh, He doesn't need you, even in the church. We do have passages in the New Testament that talk about how the Lord has designed a local body like ours, Uh, to thrive in a way that there are different body parts in that body, a hand, a mouth, a foot, you know, all these ways that we complement each other and serve together um, the way that we rely on each other. But that's not the same as saying that God needs you, that you're essential, that you're irreplaceable, that the project of God in this church would fail if you weren't here. There's always this mindset, there always should be this mindset of I'm just a hand. I'm just another part of this body. I'm just a mouth. I'm just a foot. There are others. I say all that just to say that our service should be humble. Um, It shouldn't be this self-centered kind of territorial service in the church as if we have a throne and a position and we don't want to be unseated from that. Uh, God is the one who does the true work in hearts. God is the one who does the true work in other lives. It's him who does the real work, and he doesn't need us. He often chooses to use us as weak vessels, uh, but he doesn't need us. He's independent. The true God is independent. Well, the third attribute is that the true God is sovereign. Uh, He's in charge of all things. He's reigning over all, and he's purposefully orchestrating all things. Uh, If you've been with us as we studied Esther, we just finished Esther last week on Wednesday nights, and we have had so much fun uh, celebrating this that God has orchestrated everything so perfectly in the times of Queen Esther. Uh, Well, now we see it again in Paul's message. Look at verses 26 and 27. It says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Well, you can see by the end of these verses that that Paul, again, is going to uh, come to a point of agreement with these philosophers. Uh, He's even going to quote from some of their writings as he's speaking with them. But before he gets there in verse 26, uh, we have something that uh, is, is a big departure from their writings. They don't seem to have anything on this about a creator creating one man and and mankind coming from one man. Uh, They don't seem to have um, any idea of um, this purposeful, careful mind of God in creation. Instead, for them, for the Epicureans and the Stoics, remember the Epicureans, they don't really take the Pantheon seriously to begin with. For the Stoics, they do, but it's more of like a life force that's through all things. Neither one of those positions has this idea of a real person, God, a true God, who purposely, carefully 
has created all things and still orchestrates them. Paul is teaching something very different here, that God is active as he is sovereign. He, is, he actively created the first man. He purposely gave the ability to procreate. And as man begins to multiply, well, then God sovereignly creates each nation and reigns over them, over all of the earth. Uh, he's careful here in, the, in his language. It's not just that those nations exist because God created mankind. It's that God is still purposefully sovereign over each one of them. Um, it's God who is determining their boundaries, is what he's saying. God who's determining their times. Uh, so God is not just the God of the Jewish nation. And remember, this is how they might have thought about this. Uh, we hear this a lot in the scriptures, that every nation has their own God, and they all need to duke it out in this pantheon, and whoever's the strongest is going to come out on top for a time. That's not the truth. It's the God of Israel is the one true God. That's what Paul is proclaiming that he's not just the God of Israel, that he's the God of every nation. That it's him who, who made the nations. He made them, he defends them, he rules them, and he ends them. He's the one who's in charge of all of these things for every nation all over the earth. That's Paul's claim to them. And it makes sense, right? If these are people who uh, put a high value on reasoning, well, Paul is reasoning with them. Of course, if you have this maker and master of heaven and earth, and he was so intricately and powerfully involved in the creation of the earth and the creation of mankind, well, then you can know for sure that this boundless one is still going to be powerful and intricately involved in human history. Why would he just create and leave? The listening Jew who knew the Old Testament uh, would again shout out amen to what Paul is saying. Uh, one of the greatest gifts of studying the Old Testament, one of the greatest blessings to us as believers as we read the Old Testament, is that you really get to know God himself. Uh, through these narratives and through what he says about himself, you get to know his character as he's revealed uh, over and over and over. And in the, in the Old Testament, this attribute gets emphasized over and over and over. Uh, listen to this. This is uh, from one of Job's discourses as he's defending himself. He says this about God. He says, He makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away. And we see this all over Old Testament history, that he is sovereignly in charge of, of every nation, that he intervenes in the kingdom of Egypt when they're the big bad enemy. Uh, we see that he intervenes over the war machine of Assyria when they're the big bad enemy. We see him directly intervening in Babylonian history when they're the world power. Uh, we see him directly intervening in Persia when they're the global power. You know, we see all these massive empires that it's the Lord who's sovereignly over all of them. He's changing king's hearts. He's providing for his people. Every one of these nations is just a tool in God's hands to accomplish his purpose. Well, in response to God's boundlessness, uh, we humble ourselves to tremble at his word. In response to God's independence, we humble ourselves to remember that we need him. He doesn't need us. What do we do in response to his sovereignty? This third point. We humble ourselves to trust him. We believe this to be true, what he's revealed, that he is still in charge of all things. Uh, the Apostle Peter, when he's talking about God's sovereignty and he's talking about his sovereignty even over um, persecution, that God's people are suffering, Peter tells us to entrust our souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The Lord wants us to trust him in his sovereignty. Peter goes on to tell us to clothe ourselves in humility toward one another. We're supposed to be humble. He tells us to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand by casting our cares upon him, recognizing that he's the one who's able to change things. So we cast our cares upon him. We pray to him. 
We humble ourselves and we cast our cares upon the Lord. We trust him. We're not in charge. He's in charge. Some of you have never trusted him before. You haven't believed the things that he said, that he's revealed about himself. You believe that he created the world. You can see that that's obvious. That creation screams that out. You believe that he's created the the world. You reject the pagan idea that there is this pantheon that needs to be served, this helpless pantheon that needs to be served by human hands. Of course you reject that, that a deity would need a temple or need sacrifices to exist. But you still haven't trusted his words that say that you need to come to him now. You need to come to him quickly. You need to come to him and ask for his forgiveness Well, I want you to listen to the last part of our passage this morning and ask yourself the question, you know, why does God allow this space in my life? Why has he given me so much freedom to live and not just be struck down? Why has he granted you the breath to continue living when so many others have been cut off short? Why has he granted you the freedom in your life to explore and consider and even attend a church, uh, even hear from the scriptures? Why has he allowed you such safety and life in this margin to explore these things? Well, look at verse 27. He gives a reason. He says that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Uh, God has purposely provided for you Uh, and for all, this space of living in a nation and living in a time so that you have this freedom to seek after him and find him. Uh, And he's revealed himself in his word. He's revealed this clearly. Paul is revealing this uh, to the people he's speaking to. You have puzzled out some things about this creator. You need to know the rest. And he's provided these things for you. You need that as well. You need to ask his forgiveness. You need to repent of your sins and believe. You might have come part way to understand some facts about God, but you need to know him. You need to know God and come to him and ask for his forgiveness. Well, Paul has seen their false gods, and then he put the true God on display. He told them all about this true God. He's also calling on them to recognize that there is something that they believe about these gods, the, the false gods, that there's something they need to reject. There's something wrong that they believe. They need to be corrected and have a knowledge of the true God. Because of this, the gospel is uncomfortable. This is where we started the sermon this morning. The gospel can be uncomfortable uh, because truthfully you might have someone that you agree with a lot Uh, in the workplace. You agree with a lot on sports teams or food or some other pleasures of life. But they need the rest. They need to hear the areas where they're thinking incorrectly. And yes, that might feel uncomfortable, uh, but it's what they need. They need the knowledge of the truth. And just like it was uncomfortable for Paul, you know, by the end of Paul's message, uh, most of the people there are going to mock him. It is uncomfortable. But by the end of Paul's message, there are some who hear and believe. There are a few who listen and are saved by this gospel truth. They recognize that maybe they were part way there, even if it was just a baby step. But there is a long way that they needed to go to understand that they needed to repent and believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. This is uncomfortable, but it's something for us to aspire to, to be able to gently, kindly, in love, expose the error of those who are only partway there, bring them the rest of the way to the truth. Well, for now, uh, we are going to abruptly stop there, right in the middle of verse 27. Uh, We're going to pick up and finish this this message next week. Um, But already, there is so much for us to marvel at. 
Uh, Our God, the one that we worship, the true God, the only true creator, he is boundless. Uh, He is infinite. Uh, He is independent. He is sovereign. He reigns over all things. Uh, He needs nothing. He can't be contained. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of all glory. And if we're thinking about this rightly, if we're meditating on this and allowing ourselves to become uh, full of awe at the true God, the true creator who's made all things, well, then it will humble us. It'll humble us to tremble at his word. It'll humble us to remember that we're dependent on him. We need to come to him and be dependent on him in prayer. And it'll humble us to trust him when we don't understand, uh, to continue to trust him. So pray with me that we would do all those things. Father, Uh, We pray that you would cause us to marvel at your boundlessness, your infinity, the fact that you can uh, do anything and you do not need anything, that you are the one who has life in himself and you grant life and breath and everything to all who have ever lived, that you are the maker, you are the provider that it is our privilege and our blessing to be able to worship you because of what you have done on our behalf. Help us remember, Father, that you don't need our help. Instead, we have this privilege of coming to your presence as clean, forgiven people because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Help us remember that we have this amazing privilege to come and worship Uh, to fall at your feet, to bow down. Remember that you, the true God, you are our God forever, that you've changed us, you've made us your own. Pray, Father, that you cause us to remember and marvel. As we do, Father, I pray that you'd help us follow Paul's example of taking the uncomfortable steps of exposing where others are similar but not the same. Gently helping them see their need for the gospel. Help us be loving. Help us be wise. Help us be understanding. Help us love you and love your word and love the people we're speaking to. Help us marvel at your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.